beautiful power away Coromandel. We got up super early to try and get here for this time of day. Um, and in the truck, we have the Contiki, which I haven't used for a little while. Some seagulls. And we're gonna send it out to the ocean uh, to try and get some winter fish, some snapper, maybe some gurnets. We'll see. Contiki fishing, it's one of those things, you know? It's, uh, I always say that, don't I? One of those things. It's one of those things. It's not my favorite form of fishing because you're not at the end of a rod and you're not feeling the fish come in, per se. Uh, but it is one of the earliest types of fishing that I have done since I really started getting into that sort of lifestyle. Um, and I used to do it with a kite, which we're gonna also catch on another episode sometime soon. Um, but it's just a really effective way of getting hooks out to the ocean and catching fish. You know, ultimately, it's about wild food and getting wild food on the table. So, I still like it. This is kind of bait of the hooks. So you're legally allowed to set 24 hooks um, on a non-commercial long line. So we're going to utilize all 24 hooks. And it's basically just a, a, a pretty old school system. It's just a, a hook that claps over the line uh, and gets stopped by the stopper knot. Um, and we're just putting on nice triangular pieces of freshly filleted mullet. Uh, super important to always get the scales of your bait. This makes it way more effective. present the hook, just put it through the slimmer portion um, of the bait, through the meat side first and then out of the skin side. All right, so this is a, a GPS um, navigated Contiki, so we just uh, give it a direction to go and then set a time and then it'll just go and do its thing. So. Knots, these stopper knots, you basically clip one, let one go. That gives the traces enough space in between each other to uh, stay out of each other's road. But it means that the bait, the traces can still move freely up and down the line. Gives the whole system a little bit more play. And uh, let's hope that we can get some winter fish. Winter fishing in New Zealand is typically a little quieter. You know, a lot of the fish uh, move to slightly warmer waters during this time of year. Um, but there's still good fish around. There's still snapper around, there's still gurnard around. Um, yeah, and I haven't had this thing in the water, so I'm quite excited uh, to pull it back in and see what's on it. So the Contiki's gone out to sea, um, I've just set it for 20 minutes and it's one of those things, like I say a lot, um, you just gotta wait, right? <laughs> as a fisherman and as a hunter who likes to be like hands on and in there, I find this the most challenging part. Um, sitting here and just waiting for the, for the Contiki to do its thing, I find that really tough. Um, Thankfully. I brought my surf casting rod also. Although, I don't really expect to catch anything. In reality, this is just my way of quietly connecting to Moana.
left it on the water for just over an hour. Uh, and yeah, come on, take your fishing. You never know what you got. It's not like you can feel fish tugging on the line or anything. Uh, I think you really got to concentrate on when it comes back in. It's just getting the, the line evenly spooled back on the reel and getting all the sand and salt off of it. Well, yeah, let's hope there's a fish on. And sure enough, when the hooks begin to come in again, we indeed have a gift from the depth of Tamari. Beautiful, fresh Tamari. Which is of course the Maori word for snapper. Hey, look at that. Good eat fish. That makes me very happy. That was a good winter snapper. Let's see if there's any more. We need to measure this guy. I'm not sure if that's legal. It looks like it. it looks like it should just be legal. That's another good snapper. Nice. Bloody beautiful when I come back like that. A few fish on the line, even just one or two, it's just totally worth it. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, you just gotta haul ass a little bit and like get the stuff in, but it's just so freaking awesome when there's fish on it. It's not the same as catching fish on a rod, it just doesn't have the same um, feeling to it, you know, like catching a fish and actually feeling it come in, but it's still exciting ass and you're still catching the freshest seafood. So, I'm stoked. Ah, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just it's just beautiful, eh? you know, beautiful prime New Zealand snapper. Two of them, both legal sized, beautiful eaten fish. It's nothing that I feel bad about taking out of the ocean. Just a nice pan-sized fish. Um, uh, you know, and I just use a, an icky spike, and I just immediately, as soon as I know that they're the right size, I just brain spike them, and they're dead. Um, so we've got two, uh, but we still got a whole lot of baits and the, the day is young, so I think we're just gonna rebase all the hooks and just set the whole thing up once more. to come off the reel and uh, we'll do a second set and see what happens for winter that wasn't bad look at this cheeky seagull so one thing you gotta watch out for when you're in Kontiki fishing is seagulls just try to steal your bait sneaky bastards so basically just waiting for the Kontiki to take a line and then on the line itself on the reel you can see there's a whole lot of uh, white knots they're the stopper knots and that's what we're waiting for uh, to start clipping uh, traces on, start with a nice big weight to keep the line close to the ocean floor. Um, then essentially it's just clip one bait, let one not go, clip one bait. This time we got 20 traces, you're legally allowed 24. Here's the first knot, goes on. I think it's time to haul in the second set and let's see if we're lucky on this set also. Yeah. 
man, that's a great fish. Look at that. Went to snapper. Peace. Look at that is a solid snapper. Nice fish. Jeez. Um, East Coast winter snapper. Um, that was two sets on the long line, and um, we got three fish. But like, what more do you need for a really good feed? Eh? Just three really beautiful snapper, which we're gonna enjoy with some really good friends of ours tonight. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's perfect. Just couldn't ask for better. That was a really successful morning yesterday in Paunui. We caught three beautiful snapper or tamori in Maori. Um, of course, now we're back at home and we gotta uh, fillet the fish. Before we get into the filleting, I just want to mention this real quick. There's two things that are always in my fishing kit. One is this really simple descaler, which I think I picked up from like a two dollar store um, or something at some stage. But I really find that these serrated edges, dragging them against the scales of the fish, it just works better than a knife. But you can use a knife, of course, for descaling. I just like this thing a lot. Now, the other thing, this is the filleting knife that I use. This is made right here in Aotearoa. It's sort and it's carbon steel. Rusts like all buggery, but it just retains a really good edge. When, when you look after these things with a little bit of oil and a little bit of care and just hone the edge every now and again, it will make filleting a hell of a lot easier. This is what I like to use. Let's fill it some snapper. Right, so we have a cheap and cheerful descaler right here. And essentially for descaling snapper, all you really need to do is just point the serrated edges down and just pull against the grain and the, and the scales just come off easy peasy. You can really see it like right away where the scales are gone. The color of the fish is totally different and you can feel that they're not there anymore. Whereas here the scales are still on and you have that shiny sheen. Just so want to make sure that we really get rid of the scales all the way through. All right, now for filleting. Here's what we do. I simply pick the knife and I lay it against the fish like this. Okay, so we just pass the lateral fin and coming just to the back of the head. There's actually a lot of meat up in here that people tend to overlook. And you feel the difference between the flesh and the skull, because this is quite hard, and then there, all of a sudden there comes a point which is soft. So we just cut in there, all the way up behind the head, and then just make a lateral cut past the lateral fin, all the way to right to the bottom. From here, I simply cut through the gut cavity without puncturing any of the guts. Nice shallow cut cut to the bottom of the fish until you get to roughly here and then I quite simply poke the knife all the way through and then quite simply draw it right to the end of the tail and that way that portion of this fillet has now come off and you can see it's nice and clean there's not a lot of meat left on the actual bones from here I'm gonna try and do this from this side okay I come in right on top of the skull there's, there's a little bit of meat in here that I really want to try and get right up in there keep the nice knife flat and we basically just cut along the spine the spine is, starts right up in here and runs all the way up the back of the fish keeping the knife nice and flat just cutting just above the spine running your blade till you meet the cut that you've already made 
and then we re-enter the cup from the top. We'll just start lifting that meat away. And as you're applying a little bit of upwards pressure by lifting, you just keep on slicing with the knife and the meat, the fillet, nice clean fillet just begins to start lifting away from the bones. There you go, most of it's already off. Sometimes you just gotta do a little bit of extra cutting just around the base of the skull there. We'll cut over the top of the rib cage. That's one beautifully clean cut. Snap a fillet. Another thing that people quite often overlook is the cheek of the fish right here. It actually has a beautiful morsel of meat as well. It's really important for me to make sure that we get all of the meat off this fish. So basically it has come in right here, just behind there is a, is a plate here, which you know, it's, it's impenetrable for your knife. It has come in right behind that, that's so make a nice circular cut on the whole cheek of the fish. Obviously the bigger the fish, the bigger the cut. That's not a huge amount of meat, but oh, it is a really, really nice little um, chunk of enjoyable snapper meat. All right, once again, just looking at what's inside the stomach contents of this fish, just because understanding what they're eating always, always helps you to capture an animal. There's a little crab in here. So obviously just picked it up out of the sand. There's a whole lot of um, shell fragments in here. Snapper have really strong jaws and teeth so they can crush shells. Um, otherwise there's not a hell of a lot in here that we can identify. Um, maybe just the time of the day. I don't think this fish have been eating a hell of a lot. But there you go, shellfish and crabs. Winter diet. Alrighty, so we've whipped both of the fillets of the fish, we've taken the cheeks out, we've taken the wings, uh, we've separated the head from the frame. The frame we're going to use to make some stock with. The head I'm going to split straight down the center, we chucked it on the barbecue. The only things that we're getting rid of are really just the guts and the scales. Tail of the nose, whole fish is being used. Snapper or tomore has got to be one of my favorite fish. The first recipe that comes to my mind when I think about snapper is ceviche. Ceviche is a super simple recipe where you essentially take fresh fish, you cube it up, put it into a non-reactive container and cook it with citric acid. So here we have fresh snapper, we have mint, coriander, lemon and lime, orange, avocado, tomatoes, a little bit of garlic, some chili and some red onion. And here is how you do it. Right, when you're cutting the fish up, you got to decide how thick you want to cut it. Essentially, the thicker the pieces, the longer they take to cook with the citric acid. I really like to cut them into cubes, around about an inch thick and an inch wide. Easy. Alrighty, that took three oranges, one big juicy lemon and two limes to pretty much cover the whole fish. Um, I'm going to take it and I'm going to cover it with a little bit of cling film and stick it in the fridge for about 20 minutes. Right, there you go. We've just chopped all the ingredients which took us pretty much 20 minutes. We're going to pull the snap out of the fridge and I'm just going to add all these ingredients in. Plus some olive oil and some salt and pepper. The citric acid cooks the fish meat through a process called denature. It's not the same as cooking through heat, but nonetheless it is rendering the fish into a different state. All right, once you got all the ingredients in the bowl, mash it all up, mix it all up, add a little bit of salt and pepper, some olive oil, and chuck it back in the fridge for another 10 to 15 minutes, um, or until the fish is cooked to your liking. Truth be told, going to the supermarket would have been a much easier way to get this fish. But to me, the act of catching my own fish, from the river or the ocean, is the act that keeps me connected. Connected to the past, 
to all those humans that learned over a thousand generations how to do it best. Connected to the present, for fishing simply demands your attention here and now, and connected to the future. For I will endeavor to share my undying love for these old ways with as many souls that I am granted to. Head to toe, whole thing used. Not that fish have head and toes. <laughs> Nose to tail. Nose to tail, that's what I meant. Nose to tail, everything's used.